All right, natural historians, here we are at the Humble Coastal Nature Center. Friends of the Dunes has put this together. I think that th there's some interesting history here, and you can go to their website and look it up, or you could come here someday when this is open and go inside here and read about it. But I believe this was private property. It used to be owned by the Stamps family. There's Stamps Land. Uh, uh, Stamps Road is the way to get in here. And it's possible that the Stamps are still living over there. Just uh, panning around here to the parking lot where you would be if you um, uh, visited. And uh, this is where we're going to be doing our dunes. This is where we're going to access the dunes where we're going to do our dune lab. Uh, as we go, we're going to look at the different habitats that are here at the dunes and also talk a little bit about dune formation um, and the different parts of the dune habitat, which is super fascinating. But before we go there, since I'm right here, I uh, wanted to show you some of the plants here. I think this is coyote bush. It's a tiny little thing. These get much bigger. And then over here, uh, it looks like Areogonum. It's a buckwheat. And this is what it looks like in fall, earlier in summertime when the uh, flowers are mm, not dead. Uh, they have these beautiful, I guess that's pink and white blossoms. It's a buckwheat, Areogonum. Oh, here's a nice one right there. So I think these are probably planted here because this is right here in front of their nature center and they're really into native plants. And so there's a lot of planting and uh, off to the left is a garden where they have all sorts of native plants planted and some of them are labeled. And since he's here, here's Craig. He's going to be helping too today. Good all right. morning, students. Happy, happy to see you. I think I'm six feet from Jack, so I'll just do this. Twelve. And um, <laughs> one thing, one thing that I'd like you to notice with the humble coastal nature center, um, run by the friends of the dunes, is notice the notice the living roof, notice the green roof. This was an army style Quonset hut, and now it has been uh, now it has been reengineered, and it's a it's a lead certified building. Lead certified. It not only follows the contour of the dunes and its architectural shape, much like Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture but it absorbs um, wind and and rain energy and has a living roof that can shed water and, and notice that there are solar panels over the bathrooms and it's just it's it's done very well all right so here you might notice that we are on a transverse ridge that's north to south along the north spit of of the dunes east of us it quickly gets down into the flats and Humble Bay. And, and if I want to go back a little bit in geolog geologic history, the Mad River and Eel River used to conjoin confluence in Humble Bay, and it was really two river valleys. Then through uplift, it became an estuary um, over time. So there's fine silts in there, and then it transitions to sands that were on the um, coastal side of the riverbanks, a lot of sand dropped out from from the from the river systems. So there's sand coming in from this direction, and then of course there's sands that are moving with literal drift um, down the coast, generally northward to southward, that get deposited. And those are the sands that we see come and go um, uh, each each year um, uh, between winter and summer in the incipient dune. So here we are on this long backing, and notice that. Ahead of us, past this electric tower, um, are, are, are Sitka spruce with some shore pine and willow um, down in the dune swale or dune slack. Something interesting to note is that the spruce is an older forest that was encroached upon by sand, whereas the, the Salix hookeriana, the, you know, the salt tolerant willow, or at least salt spray tolerant, um, and the shore pine, um, also w very wind tolerant, are down in the dune flats. Um, and those are areas where aeolian processes or wind have carved down deep enough to hit groundwater. And while dune sands, um, uh, these soils are, are dune sands and, and clam beach sands, um, down in those dune swales, the groundwater table is very high and gets intercepted, so you have these wetlands in these dune slacks and swales. Yeah, and we'll probably see those as we walk through them. 
In fact, we can sort of look down right below us over here. And so in the foreground, we have grasses, herbs, and forbs. And beyond that, it looks like some willow and then pines. And that's all, I think that's almost all pine down there. What's that? Pinus, Pinus contorta. contorta. <laughs> that's an interesting species. Okay, and we'll walk down and we'll, we'll show you different plants and uh, different parts. So the terminology we've got back here, back dune. Right. And then it falls down lower where almost down to groundwater. In fact, sometimes in wintertime after a big storm, it's flooded down there and there's ponds. So that would be dune swale. Yeah, or dune swales. And let me point out something while we're here. I don't know if you can, this is north. Yeah. But notice this is northwest. And the prevailing winds that form these dunes with um, with sands that are deposited on the shore and then through saltation, um, through wind, get blown up into the dunes. It, it follows, if you look at this from the air, you see all these parallel northwest trending dune swales. Um, and those are uh, transverse dunes. So we have bath dunes, trans, transverse dunes. Um, and then we get into uh, dune swales and slats, and then finally, out in the far distance, you can see a high peak. Those are the four dunes. Typically, bat dunes are taller, much taller than four dunes, and as you move north in the North Fifth, the bat dunes get, get three or four times higher than these bat dunes, which shrinks the relative ratio of size of, of the four dunes in front. And then on the other side of the four dunes, I um, mean, you hit the incipient dunes and, and then and then the shoreline and strand. And we'll give you a close-up once we, we get down there. And you guys should definitely go on Google Earth and or get a satellite view of these dunes. Zoom right in. And you can definitely see those transverse dunes oriented uh, northwest to southeast. And um, the other thing you should do is... Um, when this really happens, when the wind events that create these dunes typically happen, I would say in winter and spring, when we get these storm systems moving through and afterwards we get really strong winds from the northwest. And so come out here and see that in action. You can lie down on the sand and feel that wind and the sand blowing over you. And that's what forms this habitat. And the other thing I'd add here is that um, this kind of habitat is actually fairly rare in California. And it has to do with um, how the coastline forms. A coastline that is at right angles to those northwest winds um, will uh, gather, will uh, receive the sand. That sand will get blown up out of the ocean and um, accumulate. But if the coastline is not formed that way, such as in Santa Barbara, where the coastline is basically facing south, you don't get these big sand dune formations. So if you just then cruise in Google Earth up and down the coastline of California, um, you can predict where you would, and Oregon and Washington, uh, you can predict where you're gonna find a lot of, well, this kind of habitat. I really appreciate, um, Jack, you talking about sort of the regional picture. Because looking at that, we have nine big dune complexes in California. Uh, guess what? Only seven of them are on the coast. Where do you think the other two big dune complexes are? <laughs> One's in the Death Valley exactly. in that area. The, the, de the desert um, also also has dune complexes. And interestingly, there are species that you'll find here in the dunes that are in sand um, that you will find a phenologically different type. Um, so it presents differently in places like Death Valley or even above 10,000 feet in these sandy granitic soils, there are areogonums, the buckwheat that, that Jack already showed you. There are versions of some of those plants um, at, at high elevations that present differently and allow themselves to be covered with snow, you know, eight to nine months um, out of the year. So interesting that there are analogs of very dry, sandy soils and species that repeat in different habitats, but present differently. Julio, okay, we're going to walk on. All right, well, we are down in, still close to the back dune, in the first dune swale, and Jack and I just wanted to note for you all that look look how much grass there there is here. And, you know, dune, dune habitats usually, through the infertility of the soil and the, and the low water holding capacity, 
of sand, um, grasses don't do all that well. But because of species like this little lupin, which fix nitrogen and drop a lot of leaf litter, the soil, there starts to be this little A horizon. And so it really, so this, this facilitator species creates a, a, sets up the habitat to get more verdant grasses. Um, now, unfortunately, what, what Jack has zoomed in on, too, is rattlesnake grass. And if you look at the dead um, flowering parts, seed, seed parts, you can see it looks a little bit like a rattlesnake tail that would go through. And that is a, is a grass species that is more pyrophytic. Pyrophytic. Pyrophytic, so it, it's, it's very combustible. And so we're going to be looking at the intermediate dune, uh, sorry, of disturbance hypotheses today. And one of the kinds of disturbance that can happen in the dunes, you'd expect wind, you'd expect severe storms. You don't really associate dunes with fire ecology. But because of the presence of this invasive species, one of the disturbance types that can happen in dunes is also fire. And that tends to happen towards the back dunes more than the four dunes. There will be a different grassland community as we get to the four dunes that we'll, we'll talk about then. Had a big fire at Mad River, uh, I think it was this past year, burned it out. Um, while we're here, just a couple plants. One is this here native blackberry. It's a native blackberry. Uh, you want to distinguish this from um, uh, a Himalayan blackberry. And one of the distinguishing features is that this one's not going to kill you. So you can hold it and scrape. It's got these tinier little thorns that are not so bad, whereas Himalaya blackberry will draw blood almost all the time. And these plants are cool because they come in males and females, dioecious, two houses. Males in one house, one plant, females in another one. And so if you find a patch of this stuff with berries on it, you know it's a big patch of females and you can come back year after year and pick those berries. And they, in my opinion, are far more flavorful than the Himalayan blackberries, if smaller. So you have to work harder to get better berries. Uh, if you find another one with no berries on it at all, it's a male. And you might as well just forget about it because it'll never make berries for you. What else we got here? Hey, let me, let me oh, point yeah. this one out. And just so that, so that you students know, you know, uh, Jack and I just love all these plants, so we can't help but talk about them. <laughs> Notice in your, in your lab that there's only, there's just a limited amount of species that you have to learn and that you'll be quizzed on. But while we're out here, we want to give you a, just a better sense of the plant association um, in, in the dune. And so this one that we're looking at, this is a juncus species. There's all kinds of juncus species and rushes are round and sedges have edges. So, so this is a rush, but, but not a wetland rush. And notice that this is very, um, it's probably the thickest of all, of all the juncus that are local. Um, it, it's, it's not quite as big around as a pencil, but it's, it's pretty stiff um, compared to other juncuses. So this is Juncus breweri, and the soft, um, the soft Juncus or the Juncus balticus grow in almost like bunch grasses. And notice how sparse this is. Um, you know, there's, there's several inches sometimes, you know, between individuals. Um, and so it's a, it's a very sparse juncus where the rest of them will be incredibly dense. And, um, and so these, but notice, you'd expect that. You'd expect something to be more sparse in the dunes because wind saltation, you know, these plants will allow themselves to be covered with soil and still uh, with sand, with shifting sands, and still allow sand to blow through it. So it's adapted to aeolian processes or wind. Aeolian wind processes. It's a good word. A-O-L-I-A-N or E-A-N? Aeolian. E-A-N. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> oh no, not this one. Uh, yeah, this is Sandsbury. I hate this and thing. you know, we all love to go barefoot um, in the dunes. And this is the one spiky plant um, that drops, that drops all of this. And each one of these is fragments. A, when it, yeah, it fragments into little pieces. And it has this little spine, and you'll be pulling them out of the bottom of your, your feet. So oftentimes... I'm cursing. I... If you're like me, you will curse. <laughs> Sandsbury. Not on your list of species to know, but you should definitely know it. 
All right, onward. Okay, here we are on the Four Dune. So we have made our way from the Nature Center to the Four Dune, which is the last dune um, before the incipient dune, the wave slope, and then and, and the strand leading to the ocean. Notice that the Four Dune is quite tall. If we look north, we see a Four Dune that is um, protected by Amophila arenaria, the European beach grass, and you notice that there's dune restoration activities going on in this place, and you see piles of Amophila that are that are hand pulled. You also see um, down in the dune swale um, uh, Edulis capybaras, capybaras edulis, which oh, is the yeah. ice plant, the hot and hot fig, or South African sea fig, um, and so both those species are prevalent in an unrestored dune um, that also cement sand movement um, and don't allow sand to saltate towards the, the, the back dune. So with, um, with this particular species, you get a much taller ore dune than would be natural. And it has a really um, severely steep and slope on the front side that would be more gradual in a dune system that didn't have this invasive species. But, Angle of repose of sand is about a seven to one slope, so you would have something, you wouldn't have a near vertical slope, but these Amophila arenaria can send roots down to 16 feet so they can really stabilize a dune. Now, looking southward, you see a restored area where the Amophila has been removed. You can see all the, the haystacks, and there has been both um, through passive, there's been both passive and active revegetation. So, taking the Amophila opens the seed bank back up and, and so a number of native species come in, have come back in, but then the Friends of the Dunes have also created more biodiversity by infilling with certain plants that, that were not prevalent in the seed bank, particularly species that were that don't aren't long lived in the in the seed bank. So didn't survive the years of Amophila coverage. So that those methods are re replicable. So if someone else wants to test those same, that same hypothesis and compare the results in this dune system compared to the Morro Bay dune system, for example, um, or, or the Marina and Seaside, Sand City, um, uh, Monterey Bay dunes, they could, they could replicate exactly those methods. And we'll, we'll have give you another clip that really zooms in on the specifics of the methodology that was used to derive the data that you're going to crunch for, for the lab. Okay, and so the, the last thing I just want to show you is, hey, look at this stuff. Look at the diversity of plants here. We're going to have to basically know these different plants or at least recognize their differences because that's what we're going to be counting in this lab. We'll, we'll also zoom in on individual plant species um, you know, for that, the ones that you specifically have to memorize. And one thing I want you to also think about, we're really focusing on, on the kingdom plantae here as, as opposed to the kingdom animalia. Um, so the use of the dunes by wildlife and insects is also a huge part of this ecosystem. What's obvious to see and to test are the plants, but you know, there are numerous species of, of ground burrowing bees, um, there's lots of, of insect um, uh, interaction. For example, this Areogonum latifolium that Jack talked about earlier. Look at those pink little flowers. Well, um, in other parts of California, especially Monterey Bay, the Smith's blue butterfly uses these, these plants to, they put their, they lay eggs in there that are pink, little pink colors, and so they're camouflaged in there. So this is a really important um, uh, mutualistic species for, for the Smith's blue butterfly and other plants in here have that kind of, of mutualism and symbiosis or at least camouflage and mimicry with some with other species. Okay Craig, you are on. How are we going to do this? Well today, let me just give you the goal of, of the lab. We're, we're here to test the intermediate disturbance hypothesis which is, you know, and we're going to look at a natural gradient from a disturbance from the fore dune where we're standing um, 75 meters towards the back dune. 75 and, meters. And the intermediate disturbance hypothesis suggests that local species diversity is is maximized when when ecological disturbance is is neither too rare 
nor too infrequent. So it, so there, it's kind of the, uh, the Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold, and just right. That crossover of disturbance frequency and severity um, uh, is typically, in a hypothesis, will create more biodiversity. So what we're going to do today is collect data along transects. And since you're not here this semester, we're going to use data collected from past classes and, and past student groups. Um, but we want to show you the methodology that we're going to use um, so that you can include that in your write-up of, of, of what the methodology of you. So we'll do one transect together so you'll understand how that was done. And then later you're going to do a, a doing lab report that analyzes um, species richness, which is, which is S, and species diversity, um, which is the H prime, in relation to both distance and disturbance. And then we'll use, in that lab, we'll use single factor um, ANOVA and regression. So let's talk about the methods. And so this is where you might want to take, take notes, although it's also written up in lab two worksheet, what the, the methodology is. So the first thing you have to do is develop a hypothesis about in advance regarding the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And, and then groups will form groups of four, and you would have done the field work as well as the analyze, uh, analysis um, and write up together. And then each group will select three locations for transects. And what you'll notice is that Jack and I placed some stakes, and the zero point of the transect is supposed to be at the end of the wave slope. So you can look down and you can see, you know, kelp and, and shells kind of flotsam and jetsam from, from high tide events. Um, but that's not where we're going to start at that top of the wave slope. We're actually going to start at the beginning of terrestrial vegetation that tends to, to be more persistent. Um, and so, because we're really looking at disturbance um, relative to plants here. So we'll start with, with the plants. And so you know that this um, wooden state, you know, we're right down at the beginning of, of cattile and, and native dune grasses. Um, and then another student interpretation might be, well, we'll go down to the native dune grass that's, you know, foremost into, into the wave slope. Um, another solution or approach that I've seen students do is they start at, at the end of the incipient dune. So, so you have the wave slope, and then this little zone that I'm standing in here, about 30 foot wide, is the incipient dune, which is before the foredune. And this is that, that piece of sand that moves every, um, every, every winter. When we get super big, severe storms at high tides, this moves down and we, and we put sand um, into Humboldt Bay and we, put, and we start moving sand through literal drift down, down towards um, more southern parts of, of the state. And so an argument could be made that this is temporary vegetation, whereas this is more permanent vegetation. So, this begs the question, Jack. We're back to bias. Yep. Do we, which one of these stakes do we use, and do we ask <laughs> students to be absolutely um, uniform about that, or, or do we let those individual interpretations come forward, which may give us more diverse results? I mean, this is a small matter of where to start in this, you know, 30 to 40 feet that we're in, and I would say that the way we've done it in the past is we've let students choose, but we had so many student groups, you know, maybe eight groups per, per uh, class times three classes, that these individual decisions um, would create um, a, a diversity um, within, within a band of uniformity that, that, seemed, that would seem favorable. Well, I would say that... Um we're just going to do one and we're not even actually collecting data today. We're just demonstrating methodology to you. So exactly where we, you and I put it today, doesn't really matter. Um, and where former students did it, we don't really know what they did. So I would say this is just an example of experimental error that gets, contaminates our data set 
and we can't fix. So that would be a point of criticism of perhaps what's been done in the past, or if this were really done for publication, um, uh, it would be it, maybe by anonymous peer reviewers would pick that up. And so if I were going to confront that question, like if I were to do this right as a real researcher for publication, um, I would want to be really specific on how I did it. And I might say, for instance, we began our transects where the Mafla Aran area began, where the, the uh, um, Aran area that is closest to the ocean began. And I might acknowledge that this varies somewhat uh, throughout our dune, and that's a, a level of error that we can't avoid. Something like that. I don't know. What would you What would you do? Well, for me, it's just this question: Are we looking at, at creating random sampling zero points, or, or or are we in fact trying to make it representative? And so, I'm I'm more aligned with the way we've done it in the past, letting students decide. I think that widens the scope of, of it being representative. Um, but random would be really interesting because we might choose points randomly. We have a point here, we have a point 100 yards down, and then we have one one meter from it. And you know, so so by having eight groups of students times three pick different locations in this general spot, we're getting pretty representative um, data. And it's a nice thing. And if you're doing this as an individual, Jack, I mean, that's, that would be a lot of work. Yeah. Suddenly. You you would be out here every weekend, yep. um, you know, taking transects, and you know, you'd be in the in you know, fifty plus transects as opposed to um, student groups doing them for you. So sometimes there's the practicality of research and, uh, and, and using the research assistance, which is really what we're doing for this lab. Right. Okay, you want to show us the uh, transects in the tape measure? Yeah, sure. So, so as I said, each group is going to do a transect from a zero point selected and this is a this is a 50 meter um, tape measure and you can see from this point to here is is one meter and we're going to do 75 meters today so it's best if you have a 75 meter trans uh, uh, tape but we just have a 50 so we'll do 50 and then we'll pull it up and then we'll do the last we'll do an additional 25 but treat as if that's 50 to 75. And, and then we are going to put together a quadrat. And this is a one meter quadrat, just made with PVC pipe. This is something that you can make at home. And especially in the days of COVID, students are going to, are having to get creative about, uh, on your RES project, you may have to create a sampling tool. And it could be sticks, you could, you know, you could, make one out of wood, you could have pull an old hula hoop that might be in your garage. Um, you, you, you might find something that has this kind of a shape. And here's one meter. We'll talk about this more in lecture, but you know, size matters with this. Look at the dune, look at dune plants in general. You know, this is an appropriate size to catch species diversity um, within here. Um, but if you were looking at lichens and mosses, you might just use a one, one foot square um, because you'll get a similar species richness in something that's just one, one square foot as opposed to one square meter. There may be other methods that you would use like line intercept um, if you're trying to catch forest canopy. You know, this is not this isn't going to be a good tool for large woody debris in a forest floor, and it's certainly not going to catch mid-story and over-story. So there's different sampling techniques, but in a dune environment like this, um, a, a, basically just doing a transect with a one meter quad is a really good choice in methodology. Perhaps you guys remember uh, doing plant sampling in ESM 230, Environmental Methods where we used 100 square meter uh, quadrats, which turn out to be too big for redwood ferns because you just get too many and they're too hard to count, and also too small for redwood trees, which are more dispersed. So we kind of did that on purpose to show you how to screw something up. Maybe we should do it right next time. I don't know. We're doing it right this time. So what we're going to do in methods is we're going to lay out this transect, 
And Jack, why don't we start with that one that's closest to the Amophila. Okay. And we're going to run this up the full length of the tape. And then we're going, rather than then use um, our, a, a, a smartphone to generate, to you know, randomly generate sampling points. We're, we've broken it up into three strata because we're interest uh, strata, excuse me, because we're interested in in disturbance in blocks. So, so we're going to do zero to 25 meters, 50, sorry, 25 to 50 meters, and 50 to 75 meters. So there will be three plots. Three sample sites within each of those strata. So altogether, you'll be taking nine sample plots, three in each strata. And then we'll also be using a. We'll be looking at um, esti full estimated cover, you know, within a certain quadrat. And we'll also be looking at species richness. So the number of of species that are in there and the relative abundance of each plant by species. Um, we'll talk more about how to deal with, with plant parts that are separated or dead plants or litter or plants that you don't recognize um, once we lay out the transect. So we're going to take a quick break and lay out a transect for you and, and then we'll come back and talk about the details. i just add one thing. Sure. I think that simultaneously the most important and most confusing part of this lab is understanding why we're setting up this transect as we are. To understand it properly, you have to understand that we are presuming that there is an, a, a disturbance gradient that goes from high disturbance to low disturbance, and that our transect is going to go along that gradient. So where Craig is right now, we're presuming is the highest disturbance, and he's gonna be moving, or we're gonna be moving, to an area of lower disturbance, a gradient from high disturbance to low disturbance. But instead of just thinking of that as one transect, uh, one data point in a way, we're going to break that up into three different groups, stratified. So we'll have a bunch of samples taken in an area of presumed higher disturbance, and then a number of samples in intermediate disturbance, and then another group of samples from each transect of lower disturbance, okay? So we're gonna have three, every transect will yield three different groups of data, three groups of quadrats. So if that's unclear, rewind the tape and back up and look at this again. You have to understand that to understand what the heck we're doing in this lab. Okay, so here are, we're at the beginning of the transect tape from wherever the student group decided to zero point was at the wave slope. Now we've come up, let's say they were assigned in the first strata of 25 meters, meter number 11. So here's, here's your uh, first question. Jack, if you'll zoom in, you can see meter number 11 in red there. So do we place the quadrat right in the middle? Mm -hmm. Do we center it on the tape? Do we put it looking up tape to the left side? Do we put it to the right side? What yeah. Do you think, Jack? Well, you need to just decide something and write it down so it's replicable. Exactly. So the student groups do it the same. So let's say we are choosing right on 11. Now we're already, look what 11 is. We're expecting to, <laughs> to be looking at plants. But yeah. we have everything from woody debris to bare soil to plants. And so this first quadrat is, offers an interesting an interesting challenge. And let's let's make yeah. an ocular estimation together. Oh okay. Of the of the percent cover. Of what? Now generally we're looking at what should we be calling cover? Is it just plants? Is it litter? Is it debris? What it is is it's everything within the quadrat. And we can even estimate the percent of bare soil that has nothing on it, um, even litter. So, so we need to count the, the woody debris here. And then not only do we have strata, we have cla cover classes. So, you know, rather, if I was to come here and ocular, do an ocular estimation, and I'm going to ask Jack, Jack to do the same, let's see what we come, come up with. Well, so I'm going to say, looking down at this quadrat, that it's about 
90% woody debris and 10% Amophila arenaria. And because I totally respect Craig and I don't want to offend him, I'm going to say exactly the same thing and support everything he just said and say 90% woody debris and the other thing he said. Uh, which is an example of complete bias right <laughs> i'm afraid of how he's gonna perceive me or i'm gonna you know weird social things are gonna happen so you don't do it that way you have multiple people independently come up with numbers without saying it out loud and then they write it down then they share it that prevents that kind of weird social bias from happening but still i'd say something like that yeah and so you can see that that it's sometimes difficult. Let's, you know, let's just do a, a different one. Let's say it was at, at meter 10. And we did it on the right side. Okay. So now, you so, do it. so now if I was just estimating this, and, um, and I'm going to say something outrageous, so Jack and I are, wait, 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 are, are different. Wait. Don't say anything at all. I have to think about this. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, wait, it's going to be... Woody debris and amafa in sand, right? Yeah. Three numbers? Uh huh. Oh. Uh, mm, I'm thinking. Okay, I got something. Okay, and I'm going to say. Five percent wood, ten percent sand, and eighty five percent veg cover of amafa our area. <laughs> Dang it. I said 20% wood, 20% sand, and 60% amophila. Okay, so we, we have a difference of opinion here, um, which is not a bad thing. But ocular estimation is a little less certain. So the method that we're really asking, we ask students to do, is we created cover classes. And we, and we had them, we created numbers. What I'll do is I'll... I'll insert that picture in the video so okay. they can look at it. So we have cover class one, and you'll see this in the directions to the lab, cover class one through nine, cover class one being less than 1% cover. So that's a situation where it's almost maybe all bare sand and one little tiny blade of, of, of grass. Uh, number two is two to 10%. Number three is 11 to 20%. And let me just cut to nine, which is greater than 95% um, cover of vegetation and or associated litter. Um, so the students wrote in a species name and the percent cover. And because we're only seeing a in the In the cover class, right? Or yeah, uh, in terms of cover class. And so they'll say uh, Amophila arenaria. And sometimes, just for field notes, oftentimes we just say the first two letters of the genus and the first two letters of the species. So. A-M for Amophila A-R, so A-M-A-R, so Amar, um, and that's just easier to take notes that way, and we'd say, you know, whatever it is, we use cover class number seven here, which is 66 to 80, 80 percent cover. Hi guys, uh, uh, at this point in our conversation on the beach, Craig and I had a vigorous and highly confusing discussion about canopy classes and plants. Uh, dead plants and sand on what to cover and what not to cover. And so instead of including that crazy discussion, which would have totally confused you, I'm just going right back to the text here of your lab, which says, uh, let's see, um, basically you're just going to, or if you had done this lab, you would have just looked at each species of plant and assign them a canopy class, a canopy cover class. So uh, estimate the percentage canopy cover of each species identified in the plot. Research shows that it's really difficult for humans to distinguish between different levels of cover like 20 and 25 percent. So instead we use cover classes like 0 to 5, 6 to 15, etc. So mm, that's what we do. And the way it's defined is it's defined right here. So basically you would look at your plot and look at species A, whatever it is, and try to decide which one of these canopy classes species A is. Um, and, and think about that, wait till your teammate thinks about it, and then reveal, and then kind of argue on whether you, know, you think which 
come up with a compromise, which should be a three or two, then write that down. And uh, in this class, we only did plants sometimes if there was, uh, there's a, uh, blah, 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 blah. if the species is dead, but you think it was an annual from this season, it should be included in your data sheet if you can identify it. If it's, if if it's, I guess if it's a dead and it's a perennial, you would not include it. And we were, would not include the percent sand, nor would we percent include just percent dead organic matter. So according to these directions, it's just do, uh, assigning a canopy class for each plant on the quadrat. That's all. Thanks. Bye-bye. So the first strata is 0 to 25. Now we're, we've come over the, the first part of the foredune and we're down in a swale and we are in the second strata which was 25 or 26 to 50. And so here we are at meter 29. And so the quadrat is laid down and notice that the quadrat follows the contour. Um, sorry, the, um, the, the, the measuring tape follows the contour of the land as well as possible. We don't have it, we don't have it up in the air, you know, at chest height here, you know, not following the contour. So that's an important thing. Down close to the ground. Right. Get it as close to the ground as possible, which is hard to do in the Amapola. So just, what do you note first? Even before talking about percentages, you know, students will, will have noted, you know, a number that there's greater species richness here already. You know, we have, um, you know, goldenrod and sagewort and amophila. And then something else that's interesting here, we have a lot of, of dead litter from, you know, of, from amophila arenaria. And we just missed the fragaria, the strawberry, on the outside. And, you know, my bias is to like, <laughs> no, it no over, cheating. Bud. That's oh, cheating. Oh, Jack, I hate it when you're here. I have to really be a scientist. Objective. <laughs> <laughs> and so again, you would go through this now to get species richness. You will first write down every species that you see. Or this is what students did. They wrote down every species they could see mm -hmm. on the data sheet. And here's what the data sheet looks like. So here's. We're now in plot two location. You name all the species, write them down, and then what is that canopy class from one to nine? Let's do this species since this is what we would do, and no one's seen this yet in the class. Okay. Was this guy here? Well, let's let's pretend we don't know. Okay. Because sometimes that will happen, and so it's yep. okay to put. So if you know Amophila arenaria. Yep. And you know goldenrod, which is now yep, now no just coming rod, up, but it is coming anyway. up as rosettes. And why why do I know that's goldenrod rosette? Because of its giz. And look right <laughs> look right behind. There's one in in flower. Yeah, it's but I didn't really even have to do much botanizing. I just super saw common out here. Super common, and so I see, I see those coming up as rosettes. Um, recognize the the Amophila arenaria. So I do. A cover canopy cover class for each of those. Well, we have to come up with an, an, an handle for this since we don't. Right. We're not going to spend our time keying it out here. We just want to give it a a, a a name species number one. But I don't like that because when I see it in the next plot, I will I won't know what species number one is. I'll forget. So give some descriptor, right? Well, let's do it together. Is, is it a grass, Jack? No. Is it a forb? Yeah. Is it a shrub? Is no. it a tree? Forb is, is number one. Is it a vine? It's a forb, and we could, it's got, a, yeah, I don't know, it's got this funny little pattern to it. We could call it sticky crisscross, because it's kind of sticky. Does it smell funny? I have to move six feet away from you to oh. answer that question. <laughs> no, so it, it may not be any kind of a sage wart. So we could just give it a nickname, and that's subjective. You can, with your group, do whatever you want. Uh, we're going to call this one Sticky Crisscross, and we'll, so when we see it again, we'll say, oh, here's Sticky Crisscross again, and we'll have, you know, a cover class for it. That's common for all the transects. Right, and uh, and although if this was just you, I would completely agree with Jack. Um, because this is a student project, 
it might be better to have something uh -huh. a little bit more standardized because there's so many groups across three classes. Oh, that's right, because maybe other it's just groups unknown are have... form or unknown grass or unknown litter. Wait, so students doing another transect in another place, seeing the same plant, are going to call it unknown forb too, but they won't know if it's the same unknown forb or not. And it, I think it doesn't matter. I think in the end, it doesn't matter. Like Jeff Dunk is, uh, has led us through this. These unknowns, it doesn't really matter to our data, whether different people uh, have different nicknames or whatever for this unknown forb. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. We'll figure that out later, why that is. But okay, what's the next thing we do? Well, let's, let's um, do well, we... then, then you would just assign, you would name all the species and then put the cover class for them at this strata at meter 29. And then you'd look at the next randomly assigned um, uh, quadrat sampling place and move, move to the up. next one. Okay. Yep. And you, so you just keep repeating this. Do, do, do. We'll do it one more time, I think, at least. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do one more time because we haven't broken out of the Amafla Arenaria zone yet. And I want to get okay. into a slightly more biodiverse strata. All right. Ooh, this is steep. Okay, so we're at 55. This number is randomly generated, 55, which puts us, uh, this is in the, um, the third, stratum. third stratum. Okay, this is the presumably least disturbed part of our transect. So I just noticed that we're on a really steep slope, and these are sensitive to trampling um, dune species. So just a little word about sample about disturbance by sampling methodology. Um, you want to, as responsible biologists, you want to minimize our impact, at, you know, caused by our the disturbance that we create through footfall. Um, you know, on on a sensitive plant system. So, so if you're in a big group of four, you know, maybe you make a decision um, to just walk one pathway, just disturb one one little uh, social pathway that you create, rather than have four people bounding down the slope and and um, translating sand and possibly some of the small plants actually pushing them out of their rooting. Um, so just be as sensitive as you can and minimize disturbance. Uh, okay, that said, here we are on this slope and you do the same thing. You would, you would look, look at the species and there's, you know, there's the, the sagewort artemisia, um, the beach sagewort artemisia, thicknocephala, you know, right there. And we've got little beach buckwheat coming up. That's why it's important to learn species at different life stages. Because look at the buckwheat right there. Yeah. It's big, it's mature, it's fully in seed and flower. And then we've, Perfect. Got, and then we've got little tiny seedlings, you know, mm -hmm. shooting, you know, shooting up. So we've got, we've got a wide variety of uh, plant species in here. I won't go through them all. And then also we have some living and dead parts of the same plant species. So again, do we call this cover all of one species at various life stages? Or do we, or do we call it just the, or do we bias it just by saying the living plant? Um, my answer to that would, since we know this is the same species that has died back, because we can see plant parts that aren't dead, I would call that cover of that entire species because we can directly attribute it to that. Whereas this litter down here is hard to attribute um, to a particular species. And in any case, whatever you decide to do, you make a note of it and write it down and include it in your methods so that it is replicable. Otherwise, it is not replicable. Okay, good. I, we just want to show you one more quadrat um, that's in a more unique environment, and then we will... You're on. All right, so here we have another quadrat that... What, what can you tell about it immediately? Um, Jack, in terms of cover. Dang, man. Look at that. That has got a lot of cover. This yeah. is very different. You, you, you can, we're down in a swale, seasonal wetland in a, in a dune swale. And hence we have some obligate 
um, or at least facultative wetland species in here. And, um, and that is this, this carex. Um, we have carex here. And remember, um, rushes are round and sedges have edges. So here's, we know this is a carex species. And then, so sometimes that's all, maybe all your knowledge will give you. And you won't be able to say what the species name, but at least you can call it the genex carex. Uh, same thing, here's juncus, and maybe that's as far as you'll get. Um, rushes around, right? Um, juncus in there. You know, beach strawberry, you know, fragaria, um, seaside daisy here. None of these are on your plant list, so I'm not giving you the Latin binomials um, of them. Just giving you common names, but, you know, this is an example of something that's going to be 100% cover. There really is no bare soil in here, so it, it's going to add... You're going you're gonna to get 100% cover when you add all the um, canopy classes together. Very much, yeah. Okay. Cool. I like. We're going to look at one more, <laughs> one more quadrat. Just... My botany instructor taught me this. Diddy. Sedges have edges and rushes around. Grasses have nodes and with ligules are found. <laughs> ligules. It took me years before I ever figured out what a ligule was. So sometimes your line intercepts will, have, will go through taller vegetation and you can't really get the line on the ground. So what, what do you do? Um, you place it as best you can and kind of try to get that bird's eye view. So, you know, I'm looking at Pinus contorta here, which is, you know, shore pine. And I'm looking at Salix hookeriana which is, you know, a coastal pine that is resistant to Coast, salt. Coastal willow. Yeah, sorry, coastal. Yeah, thank you. You're coastal welcome. willow. And then, but then in the understory, since this is the overstory, I'm seeing, I'm seeing more carex species. So you, you would include all, as much as you can see um, in there. And so it, it makes it kind of interesting when you have overstory and understory, you might have 80% cover of understory. The carex is... is 80%, but the canopy piece is also, you know, add this is maybe what, 35%, yeah. 35%, it's 70, so wait. Yeah, vegetation on top of vegetation. And we have 70%, that's it's supposed to kind of equal 100, right? But What do you do in that case? I don't know. So you take that bird's eye view and you say, okay, 35%, 35%, and then the balance ah, of the understory. Just what you can see from up above. Yeah, from that from that view. The stuff um, on top wins. And you know, while we're here, let's on our on our walk back, we're gonna start to teach you the species that you must know for the lab. So this is the Pinus contorta. Right? And Sick. for for those of you who come from the Sierras or have spent a lot of time in the Sierras might know that oh there's isn't there a Pinus contorta called lodgepole pine up in the Sierras that anywhere from 3,000 feet to, to um, 7,000 feet, you'd be absolutely right. There is a lodgepole pine, and, um, and uh, actually it's a slightly higher in elevation as well. Um, and so this is the, actually the same species, but there's a subspecies that grows by the coast as shore pine versus lodgepole pine, which grows quite tall, um, you know, easily um, you know, up to 100 feet, 150 feet tall, a good, a good timber species, very pyrophytic, but here on the coast, it's particularly resistant to, to wind. And that's partly because the size of the needles are quite small. So notice it has this sort of twisting, turning, contorting um, stem form that you can see here. Uh, if you look at the needles, they come in in bundles of two, right? So two needle pine. it's a two needle pine. And, uh, and so that's, that's a, a real, um, identifying factor of it and then you can the bark is you know the sort of kind of typical pine bark light light brown it doesn't get very big so the bark doesn't change like 10 years from now the bark isn't going to look very different than the, the how it presents um at at two year old so it's a it's a wind resistance a varietal of of pinus contorta and um and it, it you can make a little tea um, out of the needles, it has good vitamin C and citrusy. It has good cover for, for small mammals, um, and it grows quite a bit taller than this. We're really close to to the four dunes still, and so there are bigger examples um, in some of the other dune swales that have 
more wind protection than this. Um, one, one thing about wind is we're just over the fore dune, so wind really crashes hard in the, in the, in the dune swale right closest to the fore dune, and then the other swales have slightly less uh, wind disturbance. It's also ectomycorrhizal, which means it associates with very cool mushroom species. So find a, a forest of these guys and go out in the autumn after the rains have come and you might get lucky. All right. We have two species here for you folks. They both have the species epithet latifolia or latifolium. I don't know if that's useful or confusing. But we'll do Abronia latifolia first, which is coastal sand verbena. I'm not supposed to go off the path, but I'm going to make an exception to show you. Uh, no, I don't have to. Um, the yellow flower, if you can see in the distance, little clumps of yellow flowers are Abronia latifolia. And then these guys are the leaves it makes. These little, cute little waxy leaves. that, And they curve, have a prostrate stem that's got a little bit of succulence to it. Um, after a while, uh, you notice this. You don't have to see the flower. You just know what it is. But if you do see the flower, you are lucky because they're beautiful. Look at this thing. What a firecracker of a flower. Isn't that awesome? So that's an inflorescence, of course. Hey, it's yellow and it's tube shaped. And so if you remember your flower biology from Botany 105, you could make a prediction on the nature of the pollinator. I actually don't know what it is, but something with a long nose and his good eyes. <laughs> So that could be a moth, it could be a bee. Bees have pretty long nectar sucking tubes. Anyway, Abronia latifolia. And what you can't see is its root. And I, I'm not gonna dig it up for you, but if you did, these, it has enormous roots. If you know what jicama is, it looks like jicama on steroids. They're as big as a basketball sometimes. Enormous tuberous roots, huh? I wonder what that would be an adaptation for. I'll let you speculate on that. <laughs> and also looking back at the flower, that's a, that's a really great umbulate, example of umbulate structure. It's like an umbrella, right? Uh -huh. You could hide in the rain under something like that. Kaboom. What's the other latifolium we got here? It, it is the Areogonum latifolium, the beech buckwheat, and we're seeing it, we're seeing it right here with this very pubescent silver gray um, leaf um, on the top side, but then not as pubescent on bottom side, more creamy colored, also a perennial um, dune mat forming uh, type. And it's got these long stems um, that put up these wonderful small inflorescences of, you know, white and, and uh, pink flowers and, and mixes with, you know, uh, typically, you know, three, three petals, but quite, quite tight. And, um, and then you can see it drying and um, and so it produces a, a, a lot of seed. And I don't know if you've ever had buckwheat pancakes, but um, that's not that far off. If you can imagine some flour and, um, and, and milk and eggs with it. And then just one thing, um, the Smith's Blue Butterfly down in, in Monterey County um, has a pupil stage um, uh, eggs that, that they that develop in these, and so they're really important to that. You may have said that. Before. And there's a, uh, a solitary bee here that loves to come up to these guys in springtime, and it harvests the, uh, the wool off the top of these leaves. And it takes it to its little tube-shaped nest in the sand, and it goes down there, makes a beautiful, soft little bed, and lays an egg, and then probably puts a leaf or two in there, and then goes away and gets some more and does it again. And it makes these, oh, what, look at this, beetle. Oh my gosh. Ah, did you see that? That is so pretty. Anyway, solitary, one of those solitary bees here does that. It's really cool. And so you can find these leaves with little round places where they've been shaved into dark green as before. And by the way, what kind of an adaptation do you think silvery fur on top of your leaf would have? Hmm, if you're kind of a deserty plant exposed to really high intensity sunshine because you live in the open, here or maybe in the mountains or in the desert, maybe you don't need that much sunshine. Maybe too much sunshine will give you a sunburn, desiccate you. So why not reflect some of that? There's plenty left over for photosynthesis. That would be my guess. Okay, that's all. Well, we might have shown this view before you guys, but we just wanted to revisit it because we noticed something really cool about um, 
the morphology here and its effect on the plant community. So uh, in the distance, you see the four dune, uh, some of it with Amophila still on it. And then this is the uh, restored area with more native vegetation. And then this is a, a, the, a low area behind the four dune that's called the swale. And I guess swale just means a lowland sort of thing. And it's so it goes down so low that actually the plants can tap into the fresh groundwater, not salt water, fresh groundwater. And in wintertime after storms, this will actually be a pond sometime, kind of counterintuitive uh, when you think of a dune area. Um, and then we transition from the swale into the back dune here. I'm going to walk up here. And what happens is the wind comes roaring down here sometimes um, when, after a cold front passes, especially in winter and spring. It gets really super windy from the northwest. And so it comes roaring down here, and that affects the, the vegetative community, as we'll show you up here. And as I'm going, I'm going to show you some examples of terrible erosion caused probably by people walking in the dunes. It happens. It's a really fragile habitat, and people start walking around. It breaks through the roots, weakens it, and then wind starts blowing the sand away. Okay, what do we got here? This is a willow, and the reason this this willow shrub is all the same level is probably because of the wind, right, Craig? Yep. So what happens is some willow gets ambitious and sends a shoot up high, and the wind comes and knocks it down. It's a tall blade of grass. Don't be a tall blade of grass. You get whacked down by the lawnmower. In the distance, you can see the whole vegetative, the pattern of the vegetative community. I hope you guys can see it. But there's a whole bunch of different species in there, but it all looks very smooth and rounded. And that's because the wind that is pruning all of those plants. Um, the wind is a, it's a little bit protected in here. So some of these willows are able to grow out on the left. And that pine on the left, but on the right here, what would you say about this? Um, it's silk tassel, which can get up to three meters high, but you know, in this, Especially looking back, at the see wind will concentrate through here. This is kind of a funnel, so this yeah. really gets windy through here, and so it's really dwarfed this silk it's, tassel. You can tell it's multiply branched too, because every time it, it breaks off, it sends out maybe two branches, and then it becomes this tangle. And then there's there's manzanita that that you're right in front of. Disease manzanita. Yeah, this is this is a manzanita, and it is also really really kept low as almost a ground cover. And then <laughs> who would have thought a, a spruce? This is a spruce. <laughs> would would look like a like a climbing spruce? vine. I don't see a tree. Or, it is a shrub. This is a spruce. It's been knocked down multiple times and it just keeps branching and branching and branching. And when a tree you can actually see this one just sort of creeping away from the wind and keeping close to the ground. That has a specific growth form called Krumholz. Das ist Deutsch. Krumholz means something wood. K R U M. Twisted. Twisted wood. Twisted by the wind. Some conifers, and I guess other species, uh, which would normally grow very vertically, are capable of almost vine like ground covering growth. Krumholz. We haven't seen much of this species uh, right, ah, right in front right. of from the, from the legume family. Um, you know, the, the Arboreus, uh, Lupinus Arboreus is a yellow bush lupin, and it is, it is, while it is native to California, it's, it's considered invasive in the dunes um, because it's out of its normal range, but it, as a nitrogen fixer, it's able to um, create a habitat as a facilitator species, um, which in the long run changes the soil to a more fertile soil uh, than most of the dune species are are usually accustomed to, and so other plants can compete. You know, we were starting to see the rattlesnake grass, um, you know, again in here. So um, that that addition of nitrogen lets other invasive species. So it's a facilitator species for uh, it's a facilitator plant for some invasive species, while while slowly becoming an inhibitor plant for some of the um, native dune species. And thus, it is eradicated here, sometimes. The lupine uh, bash. <laughs> the lupine bash. So just wanted to point out this leaf shape. You guys should know what sort of compound that is. I'm actually not going to tell you what it is, but there's a hint. It's in my... <laughs>
hand. Okay. Okay, guys, native uh, dune grass versus non native dune grass. Our candidate on the left here is European beach grass. Abronia latifolia? Um, no, Sorry, I'm Arenaria. really bad with grasses. Amophila arenaria. Amophila, I think that means sand loving, and I don't know what arenaria means. But this is this guy, and I notice it, it's, got, it's just got really thin blades. I think they're actually curled, closed. And also, the suckers will stab you in the eyeball if you sit down and look down at the same time. they really sharp tip. And also, they grow, as you know, in dense monoculture. So all that stuff, European beach grass. Also, I think, let's see, if you look really carefully, I don't know if this is going to come out on the video. If you look really carefully at where the blades meet, this, well, come together, you see these triangular things sticking up, ligules. Grasses have nodes and with ligules are found. Okay, so that's our invasive um, Amophila arenaria. Right next door is another grass, and this is a native beach grass. Uh, and its Latin name is Lamus mollis, yes. formerly Elemus mollis, which I shouldn't have even shared with you because it causes generations of confusion. So we'll just say Lamus mollis, L-E-Y-M-U-S. And it's a beautiful grass, really. I think it's beautiful. Uh, it just has a really nice form to it. And it's got bigger, fatter blades. Um, it also doesn't stick you so much as the other guy. And also its growth habit, you know, they're around. There's another one here. Here's several over here. Um, and as you look, if you get good from a distance, you can actually see them, but they just don't grow as densely as the European beach grass. I wonder why that is. Um, Craig, did you want to say anything more about that guy? No, you, you're covering it. Good job. All right, that's all for that. We'll get you some more coming up. All right, guys, another species for you. It's on your list. You should know it. Uh, beach sagewort, Artemisia pycnocephala. Cephala means head. I don't know what pycno means. You could look it up if you thought that would be helpful to remember it. Artemisia, um, Artemisia tridentata in the Great Basin is a sagebrush. Um, so this must be, is in the same genus, different species. And it does have a similar giz if you know that one. It's got these um, kind of silvery green leaves. Look, this is one leaf, folks. That is a highly dissected, highly lobed, hmm, simple leaf. I'm going to go on an edge and call that a simple, not a compound leaf. Okay, anyway, um, it is also wind pollinated, as I think the other sagebrushes are. And this one is in bloom here. I hope you can see it well enough. There it is. Not very really showy flowers. I guess those must be uh, anthers that are giving off tons of pollen that blow around in. Um, pollinate each other. Anything else, Greg? A spike. What's that? Oh, is it a spike? Yeah. The inflorescence is a spike? If you say so. <laughs> Too many words for inflorescences. Is that ignorant of me? Yes. Um, oh, the other thing, remember I said that this is related to um, sagebrush. If you've never seen sagebrush, I hope you do someday. But I think typical in this genus is uh, wonderful odors. And so sagebrush does have a wonderful odor. <laughs> Some people hate it. It's too strong. I love it. Um, and this too, if you take a leaf and crush it up and smell it, it's a little, it's, it's subtle, but it's there. And it's really nice. Silvery green, another adaptation for very sunny, dry adaptations. And there's another one on the top that's in full bloom up there. Coastal sage wart. Bye-bye. Now we know who a pollinator of this cacheel is. That kind of bumblebee. Hey, you know how many species of bees there are in California? I've heard 60. Oh no, it's hundreds. Oh my god. It's like... Oh no, 60 in Humboldt County is what I right. heard, sorry. I think it's uh, 600, 700, 800 in California. Wow. 800 species of bees. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a bee specialist in Humboldt County who said 60 species in Humboldt County and only three of them are hive bees. The rest are solitary, solitary bees. ground nesters. Yeah, that's cool.
mommy.